Here is my new to me AST Bravo MS5166N. It's a mid 90s socket 7 TX chipset based machine. And I picked it up mainly because of the case design and the fact that the motherboard has a ton of I.O. for the time. You can see this nice swoosh here it has a nice depth to it. It's a pretty compact case, it's not so large. And it came with a nice slot loading Pioneer CD drive made in Japan. The motherboard on this thing, as I mentioned before, has a ton of I.O. Specifically, it has 10100 Ethernet on board, which I found a little strange for a Pentium 1 machine, given that most machines of that time period came with 10 base T cards. It also has ATI 3D graphics on the motherboard, a DVD decoder chip, although it didn't come with a DVD drive, an ESS audio drive sound chip, which is pretty well regarded. Uh, Phil of Phil's Computer Lab did a video on that specific chip, and it has pretty good compatibility with all kinds of software and operating systems. So this machine is certified for Windows NT and Windows 95. So it's most definitely a business machine. And the ads in print from the 90s state that AST was hoping to sell this to offices. So let's take a look inside. Here is the inside of the AST. And the first thing you'll notice that's unusual is the big black box in the back of the case. And this is actually the hard disk enclosure. It's a silent drive from silent systems. And what this is supposed to do is make the hard drive quieter than what it would normally be because hard drives back then tended to be pretty noisy. It's kind of funny that back then people really tried to get things quieter when nowadays there's a lot of nostalgia for the old sounds that computers used to make. This is actually factory original. It is on the bottom sticker of the computer as an advertised feature. And given that this is a business machine, if you're going to fill an office up with computers, having slightly quieter computers could be good for concentration. The motherboard is pretty interesting. Uh, I think I mentioned before it has a ton of integrated I.O. Also, it slots into the riser card horizontally, as you can see. This may be LPX, I'm not entirely sure. But the motherboard will slot out when you pull on that handle for easy replacement. So the CPU is a 166 MHz Pentium MMX and the board has 512K of cache as you can see here the two rectangular chips with the Motorola emblem on them. It has the Intel TX chipset which is a decent chipset not the best for the socket 7 but good enough. Then we move up here and we have the Intel 10100 Ethernet on board ATI 3D RAGE 2 with DVD encoder two megs of onboard VRAM with a slot to add more VRAM expandable to four megs. The ESS audio drive sound chip, a Visa expansion header, and three DIMM slots. The system battery is tucked here in the corner. Here is the expansion on the riser card. You get two IISA and three PCI. Enough. Uh, more is always nice, but 3 PCI and 2 ISA is plenty for a system with this much integrated onto the board. You don't need a separate Ethernet controller, you don't need a separate sound card, so it's pretty convenient. Maybe I'll add a 3DFX Voodoo card to one of the PCI slots because the 3D acceleration in the RAGE 2 is pretty bad. Although for the time, some 3D acceleration was better than none. Here is the back of the machine. And it's pretty bare bones. There's no effort to make it cosmetically nice on the back. This is back when the company still was AST Research. Uh, they were bought out by Samsung at this point, but they were still somewhat independent. The AST Research ended up going bankrupt in the later 90s. They could not compete with Dell and Compaq. They couldn't get their costs down low enough. Here's the serial number. Not that it's really relevant because you can't decode it anywhere. It does use an ATX power supply, so that should make for easy replacement if something goes wrong. And here is the onboard I.O. Generously providing Ethernet, two USB, VGA, PS2 ports, dual serial, printer, game stick, and audio in and out. At the front of the case, they leave you the option of having a large intake fan rather than having only the CPU fan. 
it may have been possible that there was an option or a variant of the system that used a large passive heatsink over the CPU and had a large, quiet front case fan instead of this smaller, louder CPU fan. It's not a loud fan, and it's another silent systems part, just like that hard drive enclosure. Um, it was probably quieter when it was new. The bearings sound a little shaky now, but maybe a little loosen up after a few hours of use. And here's another view from the other side of the case. It's pretty roomy to work in. I really have nothing bad to say about the layout. Uh, your hard disk and floppy disk I.O. plugs into the back of the riser along with the power supply. And the CD-ROM is indeed a Japanese unit. It is a Pioneer Electronics and it still works wonderfully. I think I mentioned that already, but I'm very impressed with that CD drive. It's quiet and rather speedy. The floppy is just a typical NEC floppy that was made in China. It's nothing particularly special. Millions of computers came with that. So let's open up this silent drive thing and see what makes this so special. Got a screwdriver, so ready to begin. I do believe that this cover will just unclip just by me pulling on it. It's made of rubber. Yep, and it is unclipping. That is interesting. And there is the hard disk. It is a Western Digital Caviar manufactured uh, September 1996. So that dates the machine to sometime in late 1996. Here's the inside of that silent drive enclosure. It has a sheet of aluminum, which has a hook sticking out from the rubber. And it's just a piece of thick, flexible rubber. It serves as sound dampening. To remove the hard disk from the system, you just need to remove that one screw over by the AST logo here. And I do believe that this should just slide out. Yep, it does just slide out. And the power supply is a Samsung, the owners of the AST. So already Samsung was starting to put its influence on AST. And the motherboard is made in Korea, which probably means it's a Samsung motherboard. So Samsung definitely had their influence on AST by this point. I'm not sure if this will take a K6. It might. I have to look up. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it supports 3.3 volt, 2.8 volt, and 2.6 volt is not install. They're pretty adamant about that not install. Hmm. There's nothing really much to that silent drive contraption. You take the hard drive out, it's bolted to a sheet of aluminum, and underneath is more rubber. It's kind of clever, really. Uh, can't say anything bad about it. It's definitely a value add. Most computers don't have any kind of sound deadening from the factory, so that's actually pretty nice. Now the question is, how do you put this back in the case the correct way? Hmm. Ah, I see it hooks. That's fairly simple, actually. I actually really like that. Wow. Okay. So I just put back the cover. It just snaps on. It's very simple. There's not even any latches on the other side to catch that metal sheet. It just rests. So this lip just rests on the other side of the enclosure. That's really interesting. Yep, so the rubber it just clips back together. Just kind of push the ledges together and they snap. It's pretty easy. Doesn't the corners don't go together that easily, but oh there we go. Okay. That should do it. Put back the screw. I've never seen a Samsung power supply before in a computer. That's Okay, why isn't the screw catching? There we go. This 
beam that supports the case structurally. It's held in place with two screws. All right, almost out. I don't think I mentioned this yet, but the case on this machine is really good quality steel. It has no flex in it whatsoever. All right, that's a good angle. So the fan and heat sink looks like it's held on by these two large clips, pretty typical of socket seven. You just push and it should unclip. Yep. That was probably the easiest heat sink removal I've had on a Pentium machine. That's surprising. Pretty nice, simple heat sink though. Decent fins. There's the thermal paste. It is completely dry. Not much left there. There's the fan. And it's plugged into the riser card. It is a three pin connector, although with only two of the wires used, which is interesting. So there's no PWM, it's just power. And I do believe I showed this tag before. Come on, autofocus. There we go. Well, that's only one side of it silent systems so the thermal paste i chose out of my drawer of spare parts is the mx4 from arctic it's way overkill for this application but that's more than fine now the way i'm going to clean the chip is a bit unorthodox and some of you might scream at me for this but i can't even get the can in the there we go qd electronic cleaner this stuff is great cleans anything electronic I've used it on dead boards before and it came back to life after giving a bath in this stuff. It's magic. Okay, so I let that sit long enough and I'm just gonna use a little tissue paper. Wipe off the chip. Get it nice and shiny clean. There is some dirt coming off too. I don't know how dirt would get under that heat sink, but okay, whatever, it happens. I may have just took the writing off of the Pentium, but we know it's a Pentium 166 NMX that isn't really a big deal. Sometimes there's no writing on the front cap and all the writing is on the underneath of the chip, which we can go ahead and check now. Gotta love ZIF sockets. Yep, all the writing on this one is completely underneath the chip rather than on top. Some of you really love CPUs, so there you go. Put that back in. I'm not happy with how clean that is yet. I still see some smudging. A little more of that QD electronic cleaner will make it like new. Nice and shiny. Yes, the way I'm doing this is completely incorrect. People are screaming, static electricity, what are you doing? I've been doing this for years this way and never had anything bad happen. I'm probably jinxing myself here, but that's okay. Just a spray here. Whoa, it liquidized pretty much immediately. Time to clean that up. So that is nice and shiny now. Ready for thermal paste. Application of the paste is not really so important in this case because these Pentiums don't make that much heat to begin with. I'm just going to use the traditional line method. It's probably a little bit too much, but the heat spreader on that chip has a large surface area, so it'll spread out over the surface of the chip. So now time to take our heat sink and clip it back to the socket. It's really easy to work with this heat sink. I'm very impressed by it. Done. That was probably the easiest socket seven clip I have ever dealt with in my entire life. Uh, even socket 370 stuff too. It 
usually is a lot more painful than that. You have to use a screwdriver and pry and hope for the best. Hope you don't crack the die of the chip. Very happy. I forgot to mention this earlier. The ESS audio drive in this system is the ES1868F, which is a pretty decent chip. Like I said before, uh, Phil reviewed it, and uh, it has good compatibility with almost every game you'd throw at it. DOS, Windows, doesn't matter. And pretty decent uh, OPL3 emulation. It's not a real OPL3, uh, but it is pretty close. And I just noticed this. It actually has a wavetable upgrade header, which is actually pretty amazing for onboard audio. Uh, wow. Okay, so there's a bunch of new wavetable upgrades you can get for sound cards nowadays. Um, some debates out there as to whether or not they are 100% legal because they clone copyrighted stuff, but it's out there, and if you wanted to, you could dramatically improve the synthesis of this machine. Good on AST for including that header. Another nice note, all the capacitors, well not all, most of the capacitors in this system are tantalum type. There are a few of these little cans of doom that'll need to be replaced down the road. Like in the vintage Macs, these love to just leak out their guts after 20 years and start corroding the traces on the board. Why didn't they just go the whole way with tantalum? They almost did. This is just like the Macintosh 2FX where Apple randomly just put two random electrolytic caps on the board. Only the 2FX cost eight times as much as this computer and it was new. That's a computer for a different video. I just had a real freak out moment with this AST. After I put the heatsink on, plugged it all back in, it didn't do anything. It just spun up the fans and hard disk and nothing. No beeps, no video, no nothing. Thought I killed the damn thing. Well, turns out AST in their infinite wisdom decided to put this little shim. It's very flexible, it's very thin, on top of the Pentium. So I didn't wipe the text off the Pentium. It's just this stupid shim, and when I was cleaning the CPU, it was enough to knock this shim out of place. And the shim, when it was knocked out of place, was just also slightly contacting these resistors on the side here. And that caused a short. And the system refused to do anything. As soon as I removed that shim, the computer was completely fine. I am not putting this shim back in the system. It serves absolutely no purpose. Or maybe they were afraid of cracking the CPU die, but the CPU die is under that nice big aluminum heat spreader. I don't know. But the system's fine. It works. So I'm going to put the RAM back in. And then we will see this system post. It has two sticks of RAM. Each is 64 megs for a total of 128 which is pretty extravagant for the time. There we go, nice and clipped. I do believe the caching limit of the TX chipset is 64 megs, but I didn't notice any performance difficulties when I installed a clean copy of 95 on the hard drive a couple hours ago. Okay, time to connect the power up again and see where we get. And let's power it up. Okay, AST Research, 1997, all rights reserved. Memory should pass the test, no problem. BIOS revision 1.01. .01. The sticker on the motherboard says it's 1.00, so someone must have updated it at some point. The silent drive is not entirely silent. As you can hear, you can still hear the whine of the caviar. It does muffle the sound, and I'm going to demonstrate that now. When I lift the cover, it's a little louder. I'm not sure if you can pick that up through the mic. So it does make some of a difference. It's, it's not entirely a lie, but it's not silent. That That is just marketing gone wild. All right, so we have to enter setup because the clock battery is dead. We can just skip that. And yes, the chassis has been opened. Clear. I think I already mentioned this, I installed Win95 OSR2 earlier, no problem, 
very easy installation, no issue installing drivers, very smooth. Very impressed with this machine overall. Um, usually you get some kind of weird issue, but this one was just perfect from the start. So, aside from that little fluke with that stupid shim, wherever I put that thing, yeah, yeah, this. Gotta love that Windows 95 startup sound. So yeah, it's a clean install. I got all the drivers loaded, no problem. The ATI video is pretty nice for 2D, and like I said earlier, not so good for 3D. The driver has a really nice adjustment settings. You can change the position and the size, synchronization manually. You can pan the display. You can adjust the color output, and this is all from the driver, really nice. And the weird thing is the amount of resolutions this thing can output, including 720 by 480. I never heard of 720 by 480. That is a unusual resolution. You can also change the desktop size separate from the screen size, which is a ATI specific thing that they had in their drivers. I'm sure some other video card vendors also offered this functionality. And why am I 848? 800 by 600. See, this thing has some really weird resolutions. We want 32 bit color. No, not help apply. There we go. So, the wallpaper I found online on an AST driver website, it has a very nice 90s aesthetic to it, almost vapor wavy. You could add a couple extra things, maybe a bottle of Fiji water, a plant, and a, a Greek statue, and it could be a vapor wave album cover. Manager shows that everything is actually working. We have our ESS audio drive, the 1868. We got our Intel Ethernet, the 10100. And we got our Rage 2 Plus video, the good 2D combined with crap 3D acceleration plus DVD. Strangely, plus DVD is not mentioned in Windows 95. Probably because Windows 95 does not officially support DVD playback. I've seen now that it, it's set up, it works, it has new thermal paste. It surely has enough RAM. I'll probably install Windows NT4 on another hard drive just to see how it behaves on this machine because it is NT4 certified. Might make a video about that. I might put a Voodoo card in it to test uh, how this thing games in 3D. That performance seems to be pretty good from what I've seen so far once all the drivers were loaded, so maybe it'll be pretty good for a uh, mid-90s gaming machine. Uh, Plenty of stuff I can make videos on, but I think for now, let's try out the ESS audio drive. The go-to test in Windows 95 is, of course, Canyon.mid. Very nice sound this audio drive has. I might have to record a couple samples. The, the OPL3 emulation that people say is pretty spot on may actually be spot on. So in Windows, this sound chip runs in what's called an advanced mode, which supposedly has more features than a typical OPL3 instruction set. So we will see about that with further testing. I think that's about it for this video. I hope you had some entertainment value from seeing this old machine. It's in really good condition for its age. Um, yep, so thanks for watching.